Okay, welcome everybody. We'll be starting uh, chapter six in organizational behavior management, job design, and performance. The learning objectives for tonight are describe the relationships between job design and quality of work life, summarize <coughs> excuse me, the key components in the general model of job design, identify the key elements linking job design and performance, compare the job design concepts of range and depth, give examples of how managers can influence how employees perceive their jobs, explain the differences between job rotation, job enlargement, and job enrichment, and discuss how quality is being designed into jobs today. Introduction. The jobs that people form in organizations are all the building blocks of all organizational structures. A major, and it's also a major contributor to effective job performance, which is job design. If the job is not designed clearly, people don't understand what is expected of them, then of course the organization will suffer as a result of that vagueness. What is job design? It is the process of specifying the tasks, duties, and responsibilities of a job. For, for all intents and purposes, it's a job description. As jobs evolve, they require redesign. Job design is an ongoing, <coughs> excuse me, dynamic process. We will use job design to refer to any and all managerial efforts to create jobs, whether initially or subsequently. So it's an ongoing process. I once had an incident um, with an employee uh, that was insubordinate. And the word insubordination means that they refused to follow orders. He was a handyman. I was working in a school at the time back in Staten Island, New York. This is going back to 2009, I think it was. Maybe it was 2010. I don't remember. And I asked him on the way in to do something, to clean a, an office that was that was in need of cleaning. And he said to me, that's not my job. Now, this is a person that's been really been getting to me for, for a while. And I said, okay. Let's call him B B Bill. That wasn't his name. So, okay, Bill, you don't have a job anymore. Make sure you clean out your 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 equipment area and don't be there by the time I get there. You're fired. And that's it. So the Department of Labor sent me a letter stating that he wanted to collect unemployment and whether or not I wanted to contest his unemployment. Now, I did want to contest his unemployment because I felt that he was insubordinate. One of the ways that you can get around or block an unemployment request is by stating an employee refused to follow orders. So I did that. So he sued me in court. And thank God, I don't want to go through the whole story. Thank God we were victorious. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, because I had something stuck in my throat. It's not coronavirus. And... Um, I went over to my boss and I said, you know, I wasted an entire day in court. If we would have had a job description with a complete design of the job, we wouldn't have had a problem. I could have told the judge, listen, he was hired to do handiwork and to clean occasionally. The whole question was, he claimed that it's not his job. If we would have had that document, it would have been good. My boss's response was, well, if you had that document, then people would only do what's on the paper and you can never get them to do anything outside of the paper. I explained to him, well, and you have to design it properly. We'll talk about that later. Quality of work life refers to philosophy of management that enhances the dignity of all workers. Care about the people, the type of work that they do, and how they're treated. Introduces changes in an organizational culture. Improves the physical and emotional well-being of employees. We want our employees to be happy. So the quality of work life embodies theories of human relations movements of the 1950s which really started back with Elton Mayo and the Hawthorne studies, job enrichment efforts of the 1960s and 70s, and has been partially responsible for inspiring research and interest in work-family conflict issues in the 80s all the way to today. And it's important. This is a part of the work-life balance movement. Where we want to have people balance their life along with work. This, by the way, is an issue with Amazon, where they were in the, in the news a couple of years ago for being a horrible place to work. And this is one of the issues of the quality of work life was terrible. Quality of work life, of work life indicators would be um, accident rates. How much, how, you know, how safe is the place to be? Are there accidents there? Sick leave usage? Are people using a lot of sick leave? 
um, employee turnover, which means that employees leave. Stress, number of grievances filed by unions. A grievance is a complaint, basically. So, quality of work, life, and job design. Job design attempts to identify the most important needs of employees in the organization, remove obstacles in the workplace that frustrate those needs, whether it's a supervisor getting in the way of process, and improve organizational effectiveness. Exhibit 6.1, design and job performance. So you have individual differences on top. Move to the left. You have the job design, the job range, and the depth, which we'll talk about. Perceived job content. Beneath that, you have the social setting differences within the job itself. And, of course, the job's performance, the objectives, the behavioral, the intrinsic um, issues, and extrinsic, and, of course, the job satisfaction or the lack thereof. Job performance outcomes. What is the objective? The personal behaviors, intrinsic and extrinsic, and, of course, ultimately, job satisfaction. Let's talk about job performance outcomes, intrinsic and extrinsic. Job satisfaction refers to feelings, beliefs, and attitudes that employees have regarding their jobs. Job satisfaction depends on levels of intrinsic, internal, and extrinsic outcomes and how the job holder views those outcomes, whether it's internal or external to the organization. These outcomes have different values for different people. Within job designs, we'll talk about range, relationships, and depth. Let's talk about the result of job design. Job range is the number of tasks a job holder holds. If you only have one or two things to do within your job, obviously it's going to be very, very monotonous. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions at any time. Job depth is the amount of discretion an individual has to decide job activities and outcomes, simply known as job autonomy. Like today, I was, uh, you know, I was in a meeting and we're talking about ordering gloves and all kinds of other stuff, Purell's, and I made a decision. I spent a few thousand dollars. I didn't call my boss and ask him permission. I realized I have job depth. We're in a state of emergency now with this coronavirus. I found the cachet of stuff that we needed. I purchased it. I told them afterwards. It's very important to have that depth because if people feel like they're micromanaged, again, speaking back to, talk, you know, pointing back to Theory X, we don't have to worry about that here. As long as you have adequate job depth, you'll be fine. Two employees with the same job title may possess more or less or the same amount of job depth, depending on who's supervising or depending on just basically how they view their jobs. Job range and depth distinguishes one job from another within the same organization and among others. Exhibit 6.2 talks about job depth and range. So we have high depth and low depth and low range. So you can have low range, you know, not, not, too, much, not, not too much range in the job. You can have business, packaging machine mechanics or assembly line workers. And we move all the way down to business, research scientists, um, hospital chiefs of surgery, university, and then you could have on the high range side, university department chair people, nurses, etc. And that's exactly what the different that's that's the range that's the uh, uh, exhibit six point two talking about job depth and range, job relationships. Job relationships are determined by managers' decisions regarding departmentalized departmentalization. Spans of control, how many people um, report to each person. The wider the span of control, the larger the group. Consequently, the harder it is to establish friendships and interest relationships, both amongst employees and managers. Cohesiveness depends on the quality and kind of interpersonal relationships within the group. But again, if you have a lot of people, then it's harder to achieve that. Basis for departmentalization. Why do we, why do we want to put people in departments? Functional job basis places jobs with a similar depth and range in the same groups. People of the same depth and range within the job, the same skill sets. Everyone in the finance department has a certain skill set. Everyone in the accounting department has a certain skill set. Or you can do it based on product territory and customer basis, which places jobs with dissimilar depths and range into groups based on product territory and customer. People in homogenous functional departments feel less stress, more job satisfaction than those in heterogeneous groups. Okay, Taylor, Frederick Taylor, we know that he's the father of scientific management. Taylor proposed that the way to improve work is to determine the best way to do tasks through motion studies. For those of you who took me for principles of management, you know this. And a standard time 
for the task, which basically you break down how long it takes to do a job. And of course, you look for ways to make that time shorter. Job design based solely on technical data ignored the human aspects. And this is one of the major complaints that people had with Frederick Taylor's way of doing business. They felt that the human element was totally ignored. People didn't matter. And of course, employees resented that. They were very knowledgeable that, or they understood that they were getting, you know, management was getting more out of them, but they felt that management ignored the human element and the human side. And that's where the human, human relations movement uh, grew, with Mary Parker Follet and the Hawthorne Studies. Um, workers have different backgrounds, needs, and motivations. They experience the social settings of the job in unique ways. All right, the way people perceive their jobs. You can't understand the cause of job performance without considering individual differences. So the performance of a human being at work depends on the personality, the needs, the span of attention, of course, social settings, and to understand perceived job content, some method for measuring it must exist. So we have the requisite task attribute index to measure that, otherwise known as RTAI. We look at the perceived job characteristics. We look at feedback. Do you get feedback? Do you not get feedback? It's very, very important to have feedback because without feedback, you don't know where you stand. And today's younger generation, I don't want to sound like an old grandpa here, but the truth is the millennials, they need to know where they stand. Just look at Facebook. What's your status? Uh, you know, what, what are you doing now? Look at your WhatsApp status. You know, people want to get feedback. They want to know where they, where they stand. Task identity. They want to have autonomy. They want to have variety. They want to be doing the same thing over and over again. They want friendship opportunities. People want to work in jobs where they can make friends. It's nice when you can make friends. And, of course, dealing with others. How easy or how difficult is that? So, individual differences. Provide filters. Different people perceive the same thing, the same stimuli in different manners. People could perceive the same occurrence, the same, the same trigger in two different ways. Differences in need, strength, influence, the perception of task variety. Those are weak, uh, weak higher order needs are less concerned with performing a variety of tasks than our employees with strong growth needs. Sometimes you have people that are very happy to be in the mailroom. They don't have these higher order needs. They don't care about the daily grind. They're just happy to be there. Whereas others need to have that task variety. They need to feel engaged all the time. They have to feel like they're making a difference because if they're not, they get bored. And we all see those kinds of people at work. Social setting differences. Differences in social settings affect the perceptions of job content, includes leadership style and what others say about the job. How one perceives a job is greatly affected by what other people say about it. Job design strategies attempt to improve job performance through changes in actual job characteristics. So let's talk about designing job range vis-a-vis -vis scientific management. This created jobs that were limited, uniform, and of course, repetitive, which made it very, very difficult for people to enjoy their jobs. And of course, when jobs are very repetitive, that boredom kind of leads to being sloppy on the job. You kind of don't pay attention. And as a result, you can get hurt, um, injured in ways. So there was job discon dis discontent. There was a tremendous amount of turnover, absenteeism, and of course, dissatisfaction. Two strategies to combine this, to combat this, I mean. Two strategies widen job range by increasing the number of job activities. There's job rotation, changing people's floors that they work on or positions. And of course, job enlargement, enlarging the amount of responsibility a person has in his job or more so the actual amount of things that he or she does. Um, job rotation, individuals move from one job to another, more job activities because each job includes different tasks, increasing the range of jobs and the perception of variety in job content. In job enlargement, increase the number of tasks, which an individual is responsible for, increase job range, but not the depth of the job. Job enlargement focuses on increasing the number of job tasks, requires a longer training period, but job satisfaction increases and boredom is reduced. Of course, as you reduce the boredom, you have less discontent, less absenteeism, less turnover, and of course, less injuries. Some employees can't copy, uh, can't copy with, I'm sorry, can't cope with enlarged jobs because it's just too overwhelming. Enlarged jobs come at a price. 
So job enlargement is a necessary precondition for job enrichment, for people to feel like they like their jobs. Job enrichment changes in job depth, new learning, uniqueness, control over resources. You know, you could buy things. You don't have to okay with the boss all the time. Personal accountability, direct feedback, and of course, scheduling or self-scheduling. So job enrichment is a process that combines task elements, assigns whole pieces of work to people, allows discretion and selection of work methods so you have more autonomy, permits self-paced control, and open feedback channels. Job enrichment and job enlargement aren't competing strategies. So Exhibit 6.3 is a job characteristics model, which of course appears in Principles of Management. So you have the characteristics, you can have your skill variety, task identity, autonomy, feedback, and they all lead into critical psychological states. So your skill variety, task identity, task significance, the autonomy and feedback creates meaningfulness of work. The autonomy creates experience, responsibility for outcome of work. And when you feel responsible for something, you tend to give it more effort because it's it's on you and you realize that everything comes back to you and you have your pride, you have the, um, the interest of doing a good job. And of course, feedback, knowledge of the actual results of the work. And of course, you have person, uh, personal and work outcomes, High, inter- high internal work motivation, high quality work performance, and of course, low absentee and turnover. And this is very, very important. And of course, employee growth and need strength will be impacted both by the feedback and the personal work outcomes. Problems associated with job design. Unless lower level needs are satisfied, people would, will not respond to opportunities to satisfy upper level needs. Kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs which posits that your lower level needs need to be satisfied before you move on to your higher level needs. So as employees are told to expect higher order need satisfaction, they may raise their expectations beyond what's possible. Job design may be resisted by labor unions. Job design efforts may not produce tangible performance improvements for some time after the beginning of the effort. Self-managed teams. Self-managed teams represent a job enrichment approach at the group level. Self-managed teams determine their own work assignments with the team. They are responsible for an entire process. They select their own members and evaluate their own performance. Continuing with self-managed teams, switching from a traditional hierarchy structure to work teams is not easy. Barriers include resistance and misunderstanding, requires new workflows, process, attitudes, behaviors, Some may not like being responsible for goals that other team members did not help achieve. Managers fear loss of control and status. Managers are often not clear about their duties and must balance too much involvement and not enough. You don't want to be too overbearing, but you also don't want to be too detached. Alternative work arrangements, giving employees control over when they perform their work is increasingly popular. Flexible work schedules. Now we're going to have this with the whole crazy coronavirus, people working uh, at home, at their own schedules, at their own paces. Look at our college. Our college went from a primarily in-class type of situation to being totally uh, working through Zoom and online. Alternative work arrangements, the compressed work week, where you can work three out of five days, flex time, job sharing, and telecommuting. So... Benefits of flexible work programs, higher recruitment and retention rates, people like the flexibility, improved morale, people feel more control, higher levels of employee productivity, lower absenteeism and tardiness because you have more control and you're at home. And when you're working from home, I'm not going to lie, working from home right now makes it very, very easy. I don't feel pressured. I don't feel like anyone's going to interrupt me. I don't feel like anyone's going to get in my way of doing my job. All right, 6.4, we can we can skip basically a two possible schedule flex time. The common core, if you look at 6.4, those hours that you have to be there, and then you have the flex time, those are the alternative hours that you can work. All right, virtual teams. Virtual teams are geographically distributed, diverse groups of individuals. Technology allows interaction and cooperation. Benefits of virtual team include more flexible work arrangements, decreased travel expenses, increased customer responsiveness, which is always good. In addition, you have face-to-face meetings and team-building exercises facilitate the development of trust through your virtual teams, and you can have the face-to-face even though you're technically not face-to-face because you have a webcam, you can be face-to-face, 
extra effort must go into avoiding misunderstandings and miscommunications. So you have to be an excellent communicator and make sure that you don't misrepresent what you're saying. TQM, total quality management, refers to an organizational culture that is dedicated to continuous improvement, is an infatuation with quality, ultimately resulting in higher levels of customer satisfaction, and it is indeed the customer that sets the bar. TQM requires that people must must uh, be to what? Uh, sorry. TQM requires that people must be to make necessary decisions and able, uh, be enabled with knowledge to know when to exercise that authority. Job design strategy focuses individuals' needs for economic well-being and, of course, personal growth. Socio-technical theory focuses on interaction between technical and social demands. Too much emphasis on one or the other results in poor job design. So, to sum it up, in review, we can describe the relationship between job design and quality of work life, summarize the key components in the general model of job design, identify the key elements of linking job design and performance, compare the job design concepts of range and depth, give examples of how managers can influence how employees perceive their jobs, explain the differences between job rotation, job enlargement, and job enrichment, and discuss how quality is being designed in jobs today. Thank you very much for listening. Have a good evening.